Hello all. I thought it would be fun to put together a video uh, sort of how to for playing Lord of the Rings going through the rules sort of step by step. I've seen a couple requests on the Facebook group and there are plenty of videos out there. I wanted to do one where I played through a game and sort of took it step by step and showed what was going on. So this is a game in Fellowship Block. I've chosen two decks that I can uh, sort of operate against each other in a complementary way, so they're not trying to get in one another's way. Obviously, one deck will win, though. There are uh, four different outcomes in a game of Lord of the Rings, and this is, you know, how you win or lose. One, uh, you, as the ring bearer, can carry the ring all the way to Site 9 and survive, and that's a win. The other way you can win is to defeat your opponent's ring bearer with your minions. This also means there are two ways to lose. Your opponent might reach Site 9 with their Frodo, or Ring Bearer, uh, and uh, survive before you can make it there, or their minions might defeat your Frodo before you get to Site 9. So uh, those are the, the goals that you're looking at. For understanding the rules of Lord of the Rings, your best resource really is the rule book that comes in the starter decks. So if you have one of those, obviously, you know, take a look through it. It is a book which uh, tells us something. The game is complex, but the good news is it's a very intuitive game. And, you know, having a complicated game in and of itself is not a bad thing. The reason this game is intuitive while complicated is because it really tells the story of what's going on, especially in the Fellowship Block where the sites really are in line with the story. So um, there are a few main phases and after you read the rule book and get familiar with it, your best resource is probably just on this back page here. And this is kind of the story that you walk through each turn. You have a fellowship phase, a shadow phase, maneuver, archery, assignment, skirmish, and regroup. You obviously don't have to memorize all those. It becomes very familiar the more you do it. So let's just get started here. I have set up my starting fellowship so that you have a visual for what your table is going to look like. You have your deck, you have your companions, um, uh, <laughs> I like to put my Frodo in the middle, which is something that, uh, very few people do. You'll often find him over here. I make no apologies. And you have over here, or wherever you'd like to put it, your adventure path. These are representations of the sites to which you are going with your fellowship and where you're going to have fights and where uh, the minions are trying to overtake Frodo. So there are nine of these cards, sites one through nine. You have an adventure deck and your opponent has an adventure deck. And then you have your actual deck of playing cards that you're ready to go with. Now, having set this up, the actual first step before you even show your opponent what your fellowship is going to look like is to bid burdens. So this is step number one in the game. For bidding, what you're doing is choosing an amount of burdens to see who can choose the highest amount. And whoever takes the most burdens to start with on their ring bearer, in this case Frodo, gets the option to choose whether they want to go first or whether they want to go second. Whoever does go first gets to throw down their site one to start the game. Now the danger to bidding burdens is one of the ways Frodo can die is to have uh, 10 burdens on him. So he has what you call a resistance of 10. If he reaches that resistance by having 10 burdens, then he doesn't actually die, but he becomes corrupted. So that's one of the ways for him to uh, be taken by the minions is he succumbs to the temptation of the ring and uh, becomes something like a golem creature. So, uh, we will pretend we have revealed no fellowships. We have no clue what's going on. However, since I'll be operating both of these decks, uh, I know what the choices are going to be. This deck likes to operate bidding zero burdens, and this deck, uh, for convenience, is going to bid somewhat gutsy and go with three burdens. So, then, 
this deck is going to choose to go first. So we're going to take Sight 1 off the top of the deck, in this case, Green Dragon in. And a lot of people will put their adventure paths to the side, like here. I often put mine in the middle, so I wind up with sites like one, two, three, four. For the sake of framing in, uh, in this video, I'm going to leave the space in the middle. So I'm going to try and be a good person and put my sites over here uh, just so nothing's in the way. So there is site one, the green dragon in, and then both players put on any kind of any kind of uh, counter that they want to to keep track of where you are in the adventure path. It really doesn't matter. It's a matter of preference. I've got Power Train over here. Uh, he's going to represent this deck, and then this deck is going to be a penny. So you both start on site one, and there you are. Then the person who has chosen to go first reveals their Frodo and their uh, ring. In this case, uh, I'm running the common ring. I'm running Frodo, Reluctant Adventurer. And then I believe the next deck reveals theirs as well. And then having seen which site is down, in this case, again, the Green Dragon Inn, both players choose from their decks which companions they want to start with. To start the game with a starting fellowship, you can have a twilight cost of up to four. So this is an important concept. Twilight is included in the top left corner of your cards. In Boromir's case, you can see that three there. That means that Boromir costs three twilight. So he would take three out of the total four of your starting fellowship. Frodo has a cost of zero. And then we're using Mary, who has a cost of one. 1 plus 3, of course, is 4. So there is the starting fellowship for this deck. Over on this side, again, Frodo is 0. We're going to start with Sam, who costs 2. And then we have Mary for 1. And then we have Pippin for 1. At this point, both players will shuffle their decks. And this is just a little thing, but try to remember not to shuffle your sights into the deck, or you'll have to go through and uh, grab them all out later. So these stay separated. I have, for convenience sake, already gone ahead and shuffled these decks so they're ready to go. Now the game is set up. So a quick recap, both players are bidding burdens and uh, the player who bids the highest gets to choose whether they wanna go first or second. The other player will go either first or second, whichever choice is left. Then you start with that amount of burdens so I've taken three, and Frodo has three burdens. This player has chosen none, so this Frodo has zero. We have thrown down site one, we have chosen starting fellowships, we have shuffled our decks, and we're ready to go. Now a quick sideboard here. Um, throughout the game, for twilight, for burdens, and for wounds, you're gonna want some way of keeping track. The rule book will tell you that you need black burdens, the truth is, any way that you can tell apart burdens and wounds in Twilight is fine. Uh, by convention, I like to put the burdens just right on Frodo's picture. So the top half is the burdens, and then if Frodo takes a wound, they're just down here. Um, my family, my neighborhood has played that way for quite a while. It's not that confusing, and it's okay. Um, all of my tokens here are green. They're all the same. Wounds will be on your characters. Burdens are on Frodo's picture. And then Twilight is just shared in the middle, so it's easy to keep apart. It is visually nice to have different colors, so you can have fun with it. You can, you know, be a total barbarian and just use dice if you want to. Uh, just throw them out in the middle. Anything that helps you count is just fine. But you do want some way of having counters out there. Okay, game is set up. Starting fellowships are here. Both players are gonna draw eight cards to start their hand. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This person has that hand. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who dear? <laughs> I did shuffle. Um Okay. We both have hands, we both have eight cards. 
Now the first player takes their first turn. It is now, and you can follow along in your turn sequence book, the fellowship phase. So what we do is perform fellowship actions. What you can do in a fellowship, play, fellowship phase is play companions from your hand. You can use fellowship actions written on your sites. You can play events from your hand that have the fellowship keyword. I don't have any such in my hand, so I cannot demonstrate at the moment. Uh, you can play allies. Anything belonging to the fellowship that can be played in the fellowship phase, now is the time to play it. So, I have a fellowship action on this site that says exert a hobbit to play Sam from your draw deck. Exert is to place a wound on a companion, but you cannot exert yourself to death. So it is not exactly the same thing as a wound. However, once it is placed, it has the same function as a wound, so it can add up. And if you take wounds equal to vitality, your character is dead. We can discuss that further. Frodo has exerted, taken his wound, so now we're going to look for Sam from the draw deck. And I mentioned that uh, this is intuitive. It follows the story. So here we are at the Green Dragon Inn. Merry and Boromir have met up with Frodo because Gandalf has encouraged Frodo to go and take the ring over to Bree. And then Frodo has hopped over to the Green Dragon Inn and said, Hey Sam, can uh, you tag along here? And Sam's like, all right. So here he is. When you play cards in the Fellowship phase, you have to pay the Twilight cost uh, associated with those cards. Sam has a cost of two. During our Fellowship phase, in order to pay two, we're going to put two Twilight tokens down into the middle. This will be referred to as our Twilight pool, and this will accumulate. Our starting companions did not add to the pool, they just helped us know how much we could start with. So this four is not added, we're just adding what we play during the fellowship phase here. So now we have Sam. Here is my hand, I'm just going to reveal it. I had mentioned uh, that I had shuffled. This is a poor looking shuffle, I am chock full of fellowship cards. I can't say I'm going to complain though. So I'm just going to take this shadow card, um, it's pretty easy to tell which cards are the shadow cards and which cards are the free people's cards, just based on uh, the look of the picture and what the text says. But the definitive way to note is to look at the twilight cost. In this case, a fellowship card, the twilight cost is in the shape of a moon. For shadow cards, the twilight cost is ensconced in the shape of a diamond. So this zero has a diamond pattern around the outside, so we know it's a shadow card. It's also got to work on it, so there we are. I do not have an Aragorn, so the Ranger Sword is of no use to me. This is going to be an event played during the skirmish phase, so we're not going to worry about it right now. Skirmish event. Aha! We have a Hobbit Sword. In fact, I have two. So I'm going to give one of these to Mary. It has a twilight cost of one. So I'm going to go ahead and pay the one. Then... I have another Hobbit Sword, and for the sake of protecting Frodo, I'm just going to go ahead and give it to him right now. Frodo, this specific Frodo, has an ability that says the cost of each artifact, possession, and Shire Tail played on Frodo is minus one. This Hobbit Sword, if you read the middle text here, says possession, hand weapon. So it is a possession, so the cost is minus one played on Frodo for a total of zero, so I will not have to worry about adding anything to the Twilight Pool. So two for Sam, one for Mary's Hobbit Sword. And finally, a good X-listed card. Flaming Brand is going to go over here to Boromir. It has a cost of zero, so we're not going to throw anything down. Possessions generally go to the left of your character so that you can see the bonus that they give you right next to the stat line. So the strength bonus of plus two is conveniently lined up right with the base stat of the character. Let's talk about that for a second. Here we have Sam. We've mentioned that he has a twilight cost of two. Over here, you might also see that he has a strength of three. This red dot is your vitality, so Sam has a vitality of four. This will tell you how many wounds a character can take before they are dead. And then, this over here is a signet. 
These are on Free People's Companions, and they don't have anything to do uh, with the rules of the game inherently, but there are cards that work with signets, so it may come into play later. I have one last fellowship action. Sam says, fellowship, exert Sam to remove a burden. As a reminder, to exert is to place a wound on a character, except that you cannot exert a character to death. I started with three burdens on Frodo, and I don't know, well, <laughs> I do, but in most cases, you don't know what your opponent is going to run. I don't really want to put a bunch of burdens on Frodo, so I'm going to slide these over to Sam. Exert Sam to remove a burden. Exert Sam to remove a burden. Exert Sam to remove a burden. Now, to be clear, I can put these anywhere I want to on Sam because he does not have a resistance, only Frodo does. So, these are wounds. There they are. For clarity's sake, I can put them down here, but really anywhere is fine. We get it. Sam has three wounds. They were exertions, but now they will count as wounds. All right. I have played everything that I can play and that I want to play. Now, when we are ready to move on, we are going to ask our opponent to play Sight 2. So here is Sight 2. We're going to put it right down there. And Powertrain is going to go from Sight 1 to Sight 2. Of course, uh, this is a representation of this fellowship here. So they are at Sight 2. Now we have to pay for a few more things, so we're going to add to the Twilight Pool. Whenever you move from one site to the next, you count the number of companions you have. Sam, Mary, Frodo, Boromir, I have four. We're going to add that number to the Twilight Pool. One, two, three, four. All right. Finally, we look at the site and see if it has a shadow number. It may be hard to see, but the Buckleberry Ferry has a site cost of one. So we're going to take one and put it out there. Okay, now we proceed to the shadow phase. So it is my opponent's turn to play shadow cards, orcs, urukai, nazgul, what have you, uh, shadow possessions, shadow events that say uh, shadow on them, uh, or shadow conditions. There's a lot of card groups, but that's okay. If we see them, uh, it will come up. I'm gonna slide over here. Take a look at my hand. Do, 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 do. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm just gonna show you my hand here. Don't do this for your opponent most of the time. I have four fellowship cards in this hand and four shadow cards. These are irrelevant for the moment. It is my opponent's turn, so I am the shadow player. I have three minions and one possession, a hand weapon. So, each minion has a twilight cost, and then a strength. In this case, the Isengard retainer strength is eight. They have a vitality. The Isengard retainer's vitality is three. And then in the place where companions have a signet, minions have a sight number. In this case, this minion's sight number is four. What the significance of the sight number is, is that until you reach well, until your opponent reaches the site listed on your minion's card, you have to pay two extra twilight cost to throw that minion down. So, this minion costs four, and until site four, I have to pay two extra for him. So while we are at site two, he is going to require six twilight to play. As the fellowship player adds twilight tokens into the middle, the shadow player removes them, so I can only play as much as the fellowship player has given me to work with. In this case, I have a minion who costs four and two minions who cost three. Were they not roaming, I could play at least two of these minions for a total of seven. As it stands, this first one is gonna cost six or one of these would cost five. Either way, I don't have enough twilight remaining to play more than one. I'm going to choose the strongest minion who has eight and I will play him, and he just goes right out into the center to menace my opponent's fellowship. I will also play for my hand the Isengard Axe. This is a possession hand weapon. Possessions do not have a sight number, 
they do not have to pay a roaming penalty. So the site, um, sorry, the twilight cost for this card is zero. So we're just going to pay nothing and throw it on there. So this minion costed four and I had to pay two extra for the roaming penalty until site four. And the weapon had a cost of zero. Finally, this card says, when you play this weapon, add one. In this case, one refers to the Twilight Pool. So we're going to pay one back into the middle. So we're gaining a little bit back. Unless I can play any other cards or have other shadow actions, in this case I do not, the turn will move now to the Fellowship player. The Fellowship phase, which was the first phase of the turn, belongs completely to the Fellowship player. There are no interruptions, they play whatever they want to. The Shadow phase belongs completely to the Shadow player. They can play whatever they want to, no interruptions. Now we move to a Shared phase, not so called in the rules, but um, what we call the Maneuver phase. In the Maneuver phase, either player can choose to do Maneuver actions. These are cards that say Maneuver on them, events from your hand that say maneuver on them, conditions that say maneuver, sight abilities that say maneuver, and so on and so forth. The fellowship player has the first opportunity to use a maneuver action. In this case, remembering my hand, I have no maneuver actions over here to use, so I will pass it to the shadow player. I have no maneuver actions in my hand and no maneuver actions on my character, so I'm going to pass. If the Fellowship player passes and the Shadow player passes, the phase is done. So the Maneuver phase is over very quickly in this case. Now we move to the Archery phase. While this Isengard Retainer is running headlong at the Fellowship, if Legolas were over there, he would still have a chance to draw back his bow. So before we fight, there is Archery Fire. We would look for characters who have the Archery keyword Anyone who says Archer adds one to the archery total for their side. None of these companions are archers. This minion is not an archer. Neither of these decks right now have any archery actions, so we are just going to phase right through. But uh, expect that to become important later. Now we're done with the archery phase. We move to the assignment phase. The fellowship player gets to choose which of these four companions is going to fight this character? Unless there are special circumstances, and there often are, characters and minions are assigned one to one. So looking at this and seeing what I've got, I think I'm going to, um, well, I'm gonna move over for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna remind myself, what do I have in my hand? I have some skirmish events. Here's an event, Swordsman of the Northern Kingdom. It says, make a ranger's shrink plus two or plus four when skirmishing a roaming minion. You can tell a minion is roaming if they are not yet at the site at which they stop roaming. So this minion is roaming until site four, we are at site two. So my ranger can become even stronger against him at the moment. Boromir has the ranger keyword so this card can work with him. I also have Dagger Strike. Make a Gondor or Shire Companion bearing a hand weapon, strength plus two, and damage plus one. This could also apply to Boromir. It could apply to Merry because he has a Hobbit Sword. It could also apply to Frodo because he has a Hobbit Sword. It will not apply to Sam. I also have Strength of Kings. This is a special kind of event called a response. So this says, response, if a skirmish event is played during a skirmish involving a Gondor man, cancel that event. If that sounds a little ridiculous right now because I've only shown uh, fellowship actions, you don't want to cancel uh, your fellowship event, so you don't have to play this. Uh, I suppose technically, theoretically, you could cancel one of your events if you wanted to, um, maybe to get this out of your hand. We're not going to worry about that right now, though. This will be in case my opponent plays a shadow skirmish event that I don't want to deal with, then I can throw this down. 
So those are ready to go. I'm going to choose to fight the Isengard retainer with Boromir. Here we are. Okay, the assignment phase is done because I have assigned the Isengard retainer to Boromir. We are now moving on to the skirmish phase. This is, again, a shared phase, so we both take skirmish actions until both players pass. As with the maneuver phase and the archery phase, the fellowship player has the first opportunity. Boromir has a total strength of 8 right now. 7 plus 1. This minion has a total strength of 8 plus 2. Boromir has less strength than the minion, so he is losing the skirmish. An important note to make, fellowship characters will lose all skirmishes in which their strength is less than the minion they are fighting, or in which their strength is tied with the minion they are fighting. So if I were to play my dagger strike right now and make Boromir's strength 10, I would be 10 to this minion's 10, and Boromir would still be losing the fight. I'm going to choose instead to play Swordsman of the Northern Kingdom as my first skirmish action. This will make Boromir strength plus 4, so he is 12 to this minion's 10. Now, this minion has less strength than Boromir and is losing. Shadow player does not have any actions in hand, so they are going to pass. The Fellowship player has an opportunity yet again to play Fellowship action if they want to. I'm going to choose to let that pass, so Boromir wins the skirmish, and the Isengard retainer takes a wound for losing. Generally, when you lose a skirmish, the losing character takes one wound for losing that fight. The way to increase the amount of damage you take is with damage bonuses. So if I wanted to, I can play a dagger strike now, which says, again, make a Gondor or Shire Companion bearing a hand weapon strength plus two and damage plus one. That would give Vormir the opportunity to deal two wounds to the Isengard retainer. He has three, so I'm not going to get rid of him by playing this, so I'm not going to waste this card just yet. I want to have it on hand. So we're going to keep that. Skirmish events, after you play them, will go directly into your discard pile. So I'm going to put that right under my deck. This is gone. It has been used for the game. This minion will take one wound. Now we move on to the regroup phase. So the first thing we do is perform regroup actions. Once again, this is a shared phase, so the fellowship player has the first opportunity, and then the shadow player has an opportunity. We keep using those regroup actions until both players pass consecutively. Looking through my hand, I do not have any regroup actions. None of my companions have anything relevant to that. There are no regroup actions in that hand over there. However, this Isengard retainer does have a regroup action on his card. So we will get to that in a moment. Fellowship player passes, no regroup actions. Shadow player has an opportunity. The Isengard retainer says, regroup, exert this minion to make the free people's player wound a companion. So I'm going to put an exertion on the Isengard retainer. Now the fellowship player has to choose one of their companions to wound. Because of the writing on this card, it is the fellowship player's choice who they would like to wound. Otherwise, the Isengard retainer would target Sam directly and knock him out because he only has one life left. One vitality. I am going to take the wound to Frodo. Frodo has all sorts of vitality because he also has resistance, so I don't feel bad about tapping into that. I'm not too worried about uh, this player um, abusing wounds on the ring bearer, although they may have an opportunity for that later. Uh, Frodo takes his wound. We have an opportunity again to use a regroup action. Pass. The shadow player has another opportunity to use a regroup action, but there are no regroup events in that hand, and this minion does not have any vitality left with which to exert, because again, you cannot exert equal to your vitality. At this point, the Isengard retainer with two wounds on him to his three vitality is considered exhausted. So exhausted is when a character has wounds equal to one less than their total vitality. Sam, with four vitality and three wounds, is also exhausted. 
Now, both players have passed three group actions. The shadow player, not the fellowship player, has the opportunity now to reconcile. So, what this means is that the shadow player gets to look through their hand, and I'll show it to you again. We've got six cards left. And they can choose to get rid of one card if they want and just put it directly into their discard pile. This is not a requirement. You can keep all the cards in here. I will discard there and back again because I have an extra copy of it and it's unique, so I can't play more than one at the same time. The benefit to discarding an extra unneeded card is when I have finished, I get to draw from my deck up until I have eight cards in my hand again. So that is the second part of reconciling. I've discarded a card, now I draw back up to eight. One, two, and three. I'm gonna put Bounder and Dagger Strike over here with the Fellowship cards. Now, of course, my opponent does not see my hand. They do not know what is going on. And the Fellowship player does not get to reconcile unless they choose not to move on. So after the Shadow player has reconciled, the Fellowship player has to make a choice. Do they want to move to site three, having moved two sites in the same turn, or do they want to stay at site two? The benefit to staying at a site is at the end of the turn, all minions will be discarded. So this minion would no longer be relevant, he would play, be placed directly into the discard pile. The benefit to deciding to move on is, of course, that your fellowship is getting closer towards site nine, and this game is a bit of a race. This uh, situation calls for moving on again. So the Fellowship is going to move on, which means this Isengard Retainer will stay in place and threaten again. The Shadow Player will now retrieve Site 3 from their Adventure Path and play it down. This Fellowship will move their counter to site three. Once again, because we are moving, we will count the number of companions in our fellowship, one, two, three, four, and add that amount to the twilight pool. We will also check if there is any twilight cost. It is a twilight cost of zero, so we will not add anything for it. Now, the shadow player has a total of seven to work with. If the fellowship has already moved on, they do not get a second fellowship phase. The fellowship phase only exists at the very beginning of the turn. So, having finished the regroup phase, with the fellowship moving on, and the proper amount of twilight being paid, it is now, once again, the shadow phase. I'm going to look through my hand and decide that I do want to play another minion. He has a cost of three, and we are at Site 3, not yet Site 4, so I will have to pay the roaming penalty for him. Alright, we will move on to the Maneuver phase. Neither player in this case has Maneuvers, both will pass consecutively. It is now the Archery phase. Neither player has any Archery or any Archery actions, so both players consecutively pass. And it is now, once again, the Assignment phase. So the Fellowship player will choose who they wish to have fight. So, I'm looking at this, and I see that this minion is looking kind of weak. He's got a strength of 7, and if it's possible, I want to go ahead and wound him. So I'm just going to... Hmm... That could be dangerous. Yes, let's not waste life here. All right. We are going to uh, actually, yes, assign the Isengard Servant to Boromir. Boromir has a strength of 8. The Isengard Servant has a strength of 7. Meanwhile, I am going to count on Frodo's resistance to save me a little bit of burned vitality here, and I will assign the Isengard Retainer to Frodo. At the moment, this is not too risky of a decision. Now... We're going to start with Boromir, and when you have multiple companions <clears throat> assigned to multiple minions after the assignment phase, 
the fellowship player gets to choose in which order to resolve various skirmishes. As a second note, this is the fellowship player's hand. It is generally not known to the shadow player. However, I have it revealed just so that we can see what's going on. Boromir is going to fight first. He has a strength of 8 to this minion 7. Since I am winning the skirmish, I am not concerned about playing any skirmish events to try to get stronger. I'm not too invested in using the uh, dagger strike to become damage plus 1. So I'm just going to... You know what? Since this minion has your group action, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this dagger strike and I'm going to play it. <laughs> I am strength 10 to this minion 7, so there. The shadow player will pass. Now it's the fellowship player's chance again to play any actions. I will pass, because I'm winning and I'm damage plus 1. Because Boromir is strength 10 to that minion 7, and he is damage plus 1, this minion will take 2 wounds for losing the skirmish. Skirmish. Alright, so that fight is over. Here we are with Frodo. Frodo is strength 6 to this minion's 10. Right now, I am okay with Frodo losing, because I plan to just take a burden from losing the skirmish. I'm going to pass. I choose no skirmish action. Now as the shadow player, this minion is strength 10 to Frodo's 6. This shadow player is going to play a skirmish action from their hand. Servants to Sauron. Make an Isengard Orc, which this Isengard Retainer is, strength plus two or plus three if you have fewer than three cards in hand. This hand has many more than three cards, but the plus two is still very helpful. This will go directly into the discard pile. Now we have a problem. This mini is strength 12 compared to Frodo's six, and this brings us to another rule. When a minion has double the strength of a companion, or when a companion has double the strength of a minion, the minion or companion with the lower strength is overwhelmed. In this case, Frodo has a strength of only 6 to this minion's 12. So, if the skirmish resolves without any further skirmish actions, then the result of the skirmish would be that Frodo is overwhelmed with a total strength of 6 to 12, and that would mean Frodo is automatically dead. However, the skirmish has not resolved yet. Just because a minion reaches 12 to Frodo 6 does not mean that Frodo is already overwhelmed, because I still have a chance to respond if I have any skirmish actions or skirmish special abilities to use. Skirmish special abilities, say that five times fast. Realizing that Frodo is in danger of literally dying right now, I'm going to use Mary's Skirmish Special Ability, which says if Mary is not assigned to a skirmish, that is to say, if no one is fighting Mary right now, and no one is, exert him twice to add his strength to another companion. So I'm going to take two exertions, put them on Mary, and he will add his strength of 5, 3, and then the 2 for the Hobbit Sword, to Frodo's strength of 6. Frodo is now strength 11 to the Isengard Retainer's 12. I will pass to the Shadow Player. The Shadow Player will not choose any skirmish actions. The Fellowship Player has one more chance. They will choose no further skirmish actions. The skirmish now resolves, with Frodo at a strength of 11 to this minion's 12. Frodo loses, but only by one strength. He is not overwhelmed, and so he will not die. With Frodo, I have a choice. I can either take a wound as a result of losing the skirmish, or, being about to take a wound, I can choose the response action of the ring. If Bear is about to take a wound in a skirmish, he wears the one ring until the regroup phase. It says he wears, but it is an option. I can choose to do it, I can choose not to do it. While wearing the one ring, each time the ring bearer is about to take a wound during a skirmish, add a burden instead. If I choose to wear the one ring, that is a game state 
in which the ring bearer is wearing the one ring. I'm going to have Frodo wear the ring, so this wound that he would be about to take will be a burden instead. Now this fight is done, there are no more minions to skirmish, and we move to the regroup phase. The very first thing that happens is, per the ring's text, this ring is no longer worn. So Frodo does not any longer have the ring on, and any wounds he takes are now wounds. So he no longer wears the ring. Uh, if it's slightly confusing, Frodo always has the ring, so he always has the strength bonus from it. Um, wearing the ring is just a special circumstance with it. So he always carries it, sometimes he wears it, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, essentially up to the Free People's Player. I do not have any regroup actions to use as the Fellowship Player. As the Shadow Player, both of my minions are exhausted and neither of them can exert to wound companions, so we will choose no regroup actions. So now we uh, reconcile the Shadow Player's hand and the Fellowship Player chooses whether to move on or not, except this Fellowship Player has chosen to move twice already. And when you have two players against each other, the move limit for the Fellowship is two sites. So the Fellowship player's choice is automatically made, or rather, they have no choice. They cannot move any further. Congratulations, the Fellowship has moved as much as they can. So a good opening, uh, opening turn for the Fellowship. However, the Shadow player has had a pretty good turn here too, because we are at a Sanctuary, which we will get to at the next, uh, at this fellowship's next phase, where this fellowship can heal five wounds. But because there are seven wounds across this fellowship, this minion side has already started to make a dent, and this minion side strategy is mass wounding to the fellowship. So a little bit of ground has been gained already. Now, because the fellowship cannot move any further, or they choose not to move on, this will mean that the shadow minions are taken into the discard pile. Per the story, the Fellowship has made it over to Rivendell, specifically to Frodo's bedroom, and uh, the fact that the orcs are being discarded essentially assumes that uh, some characters have come to our aid, some Rivendell archers have thrown some arrows out there and uh, our minions are gone, expelled from the Rivendell borders, and that is that. At the end of the turn, with nothing else to do, this twilight is removed. We go back down to zero. Finally, both players will reconcile their hands. I'm going to look at mine and say that uh, I want some, uh, some shadow cards coming in here. I'm going to get rid of Strength of Kings. Ranger Sword is a bit redundant right now, or at least unnecessary, because I don't have Aragorn yet, but I do hope to have him later, and I can only get rid of one card anyways, so I'm going to get rid of that one. Now I get to draw back up to eight, so that's going to be six cards. One, two, three, four, five, seven. Hey, look at that. All right. Over here, I'm going to look at my hand and say that uh, without any weapons in my hand yet. This dagger strike is not going to do me any good, so I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, now I may draw up to eight. Dum. <laughs> well, it's a bit frustrating to see the dagger strike again, but I do feel vindicated. I definitely got rid of the right card. Okay, this is not terrible uh, for this player's next fellowship phase. They've got six fellowship cards in hand and just two shadow cards. There's a lot that they can do. All right, both players have drawn up to eight. The turn now passes to your opponent. Now I am my opponent, hello. <laughs> like Gollum and Smeagol. All right, so it is now this player's fellowship phase. As a reminder, they are at site one. So I am now at the Green Dragon Inn as this player. Fellowship actions. This site says, exert a hobbit to play Sam from your draw deck. I already have Sam, so whatever. I may now play 
cards during the fellowship phase, which may be allowed to be played. I have quite a few skirmish events here, uh, so these are irrelevant yet, but they will be relevant soon. I will play Bounder. This is a special character called an ally. He has a twilight cost of one, and you can see in the middle he has a designation of ally, home to, hobbit. Allies, rather than going along with your companions, go just behind them in the region that you call your support area. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Okay, Bounder is in the support area. He is not directly with the companions. He has a Twilight Cost of 1. Hi, Misha. Say hello to my dog. <laughs> uh, let me help her out a second. And we're back. Bounder has a Twilight Cost of 1. So, I'm going to add 1 to the Twilight Pool. I am also going to play there and back again. This is a condition which specifically goes on to one of my hobbits. Bearer must be a hobbit companion. I'm going to play it on Frodo because, once again, this deck is running Reluctant Adventurer, who makes the twilight cost of most cards played on him minus one. So this has a cost of one reduced by one down to zero, so I do not have to pay any twilight for it. And that is all that this fellowship has to say right now. I'm a little worried, but we've got a lot of stealth events. We'll see what goes on. And uh, I've stocked the sites in this fellowship's favor because it likes to go second anyhow. Now, I count the number of companions that I have. Bounder is an ally, so he is not relevant for the moment. I have Pippin, Mary, Frodo, Sam. So I'm adding four Twilight to the pool. I will also look at the site cost of the site. It is one. And now my fellowship moves to Buckleberry Ferry. Alrighty. What have I got here? Oh my goodness. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yes, make sure you reconcile. All right. <laughs> Darn. To be fair, uh, this would have been a frustrating shadow phase for me anyways. I have one minion, I have six twilight. This minion has a shadow cost, uh, well yes, he has a twilight cost of two. His sight number is four, so he will cost two extra to play. I'm gonna throw him down because I want him out there and he is stronger than all these other guys anyways. <laughs> Which is not saying much. All right, he costs two. And I have to pay the extra two for the roaming penalty. And there we are. Now let me just check my hand again. Ranger Sword, Dagger Strike, Blade of Gun, or Saga Anvil, Hobbit Sword, Hobbit Intuition. Alrighty. Okay, we got two Twilight left. That will just hang around. That's it, that's my Shadow Phase. All right, it's the Maneuver Phase. As a Fellowship player, I get the first opportunity I could use there and back again, which has a maneuver special ability on it, but I'm going to choose to let that go because it is not relevant right now. I pass. Shadow player, pass. Maneuver phase, over. Archery, not yet. Both players pass, pass. Assignment, not in this case. We have Buckleberry Fairy here, which says, while only hobbits are in the fellowship, there are no assignment and skirmish phases at Buckleberry Ferry. I have Pippin, Mary, Frodo, Sam. These are all hobbits. They are the only characters in my fellowship. So there will be no assignment and there will be no skirmish for the Goblin Spearman. Which means we will proceed directly to the regroup phase. I have no regroup actions to play. That uh, shadow player has no regroup actions to play. However, they do get the opportunity to reconcile. Yes. Um, right now, the best looking card, oh, it hurts, but we're gonna get rid of the ranger sword. Bye. All right. Now I have six cards total, so I get to draw up to two. <laughs> All right. 
Well, I'm glad I'm glad this deck went first, I guess. Alright. So there's that hand over here. This fellowship player does not get to reconcile because they are the fellowship player. The regroup phase is now done. We are going to move on. So I have one, two, three, four companions. We're moving to Frodo's bedroom in Rivendell. It has a cost of zero. Whoosh, add zero. All right, there is six in the Twilight Pool. Again, we do not repeat Fellowship Phase. We do repeat Shadow Phase. You saw the hand there, though. There are no extra minions, no conditions, no possessions. All we have are skirmish events. So, Shadow Player is going to pass. Shadow Phase is over. Now, Maneuver Phase. I could use Frodo's there and back again, but looking at my hand, I think I'm just going to troll this guy and uh, not worry about it. Then, uh, I will say um, archery. There's no archery. Both players pass. Archery phase is over. Assignment. I'm going to try to provoke my opponent into playing something or other. So I'm going to send the Goblin Spearman at Frodo. All right, here we are with Frodo, and, um, you know, I'm not even going to give him the choice. Uh, I've assigned Frodo, the assignment phase is over, here we are in the skirmish phase, and as a skirmish action, I'm just going to go ahead and play Hobbit Intuition with a twilight cost of one, which reads, at sites one to four, cancel a skirmish involving a Hobbit. At any other site, make a Hobbit strength plus three. We are at site three, which is considered sites one to four. <laughs> sites one to four. So Frodo's skirmish is canceled, which literally means even though I assigned this minion to Frodo, we pretend like the fight has already happened and that nothing happened. Neither player takes a wound, neither player wins or loses the skirmish, but that is done. No more assignments, no more skirmishes. We are just over. I cannot move anymore as this fellowship player. So this minion disappears right into the discard pile, and both players now reconcile. Okay, it is now the first player's second turn. We are at Site 3, which is considered a sanctuary. Again, following in line with the story, we have made it to Rivendell, so we have made it past the Nazgul, and uh, we are going to figure out what to do with the ring, because we are uh, in sort of a safe haven, we now get to rest and recuperate, which means we get to heal five wounds, five, yes, five wounds from our characters. Um, so here we are with Frodo, Mary, and Sam, and I have seven wounds total. I want to repair Mary down all the way so he can have vitality to exert. So that was two wounds. I think I'd like to heal Sam down two. So that's four, and Frodo down one. So now Frodo and Sam both have a wound. Mary is clean bill of health. Now we get to do uh, fellowship actions, which means we get to play fellowship cards. This Twilight Pool is cleared, don't mind me, because we are starting over. Fellowship phase. Let us play a Hobbit Sword on Sam. This will cost us one. Let us also play Wow. Uh, a Blade of Gondor on Boromir. Gotta make way. So, I'm gonna insert that right there for one. And I'm going to play the Saga of Elendil. And just be glad that this is Fellowship Lock and Grima Wormtongue is not around to pester me. All right, Boromir is souped up. I also have a Hobbit Sword in my hand ready to go, but one, two, three, all of my companions who could use the Hobbit Sword already have one. So, that's us. Hobbit Sword, Blade of Gondor, Saga of Elendil, one, two, three. I am done with my Fellowship actions, so I must now move on, which means the Shadow Player will furbish us with the next site, Site 4. All right. I count my companions, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and I look at the site number cost, it is three, one, two, three. 
So, we now have a total of 10 for the Shadow Player to use. Fellowship phase is over. Turn passes to Shadow Player. Also, we're going to move this Fellowship's counter from Site 3 to Site 4. Make sure we remember. We are now at the Mithril Mine, so we have entered Moria. Moria. Hey, great news for your uh, minions. So, since we are at Site 4, we no longer have to pay the roaming penalty, at least for the Isengard Orcs. Sneak peek, I also have a Uric Slayer in my hand, who is an Uruk High. But, if you can see it, he has a site number of 5. So he will have to wait and still, you know, if I want to play him this turn, and have to pay the roaming penalty. But my orcs should be good to go. So what I'm going to do is play an Isengard Retainer for 4. We are at site 4. No roaming penalty. I will play an Isengard Servant for 3. No roaming penalty. I have 3 left. I'm going to use this site's shadow action. Remove 1 to play a Shadow Weapon from your discard pile. Well, don't mind if I do. I think I want to pose a legitimate threat to Boromir, so I'm gonna give the Isengard Axe to the Retainer, <laughs> which I can't say seriously. All right, but, and this is fun, having played the Isengard Axe, it gives me the opportunity to put one to my back. So it's kind of free from my discard pile. All right, cool. I am done with shadow actions, shadow cards, so shadow phase is over. Maneuver phase, I don't believe there's anything relevant there. Both players pass. Archery phase, both players pass. Assignment time, all right. Let me imagine for a moment. In this corner, I have dagger strikes and hobbit intuitions aplenty. I can cancel some skirmishes. I can also throw the hurt down with Boromir. Boromir got a Blade of Gondor this turn, which makes him automatically damage plus one, so any minion who loses to him is going to take two wounds. He also has the ability to exert to wound an Orc or uruk -hai he is skirmishing, but this Shadow Side likes having wounds on companions, so I'm going to try not to resort to that ability. I don't think I have to worry about it too much. Then we have the Saga of Elendil, which gives him plus one vitality for a total of four. I can discard this to make Boromir Strength plus two during a skirmish if I want to. Um, I do like the extra vitality against these minions though, so best as I can, I'll try to keep that going. All right, looking at my hand and seeing I got Dagger Strike and Dagger Strike, I think Boromir stands a pretty good chance. So I am going to, during the assignment phase, send a retainer over to Boromir. Their Strength 10 to 10. I will also send the Isengard Servant over to... Oh... Frodo? We're going to start with Boromir here. So, Fellowship Player gets the first action. I'm Strength 10 to your 10, I am losing. However, I will play a Dagger Strike. Boromir is now Strength plus 2 and Damage plus 1. He also has Damage plus 1 on his Blade of Gondor. Damage bonuses do stack. So, Boromir is now Damage plus 2 which means if this minion loses the skirmish, then this minion will take three wounds and get out of here. I have done a skirmish action as the Fellowship player. We pass to the Shadow player. The Shadow player is going to play Servants to Sauron. So now, 12 to 12. Boromir is stubborn. We're going to throw down a Dagger Strike. 14 to 12. Ooh, guess who else is stubborn? This guy. So now we are at 14 to 14. Yeah. Boromir is now strength 14 and damage plus one, two, three, and really doesn't want to lose the skirmish because uh, he wants to capitalize on the damage bonus that he has. So I am just going to be, uh, uh, what's the word? Petty. I'm going to throw away the Saga of Elendil, throw it right into my discard pile, using its ability to make Boromir strength plus two, <laughs> contradicting what I just said. So Boromir is now strength 16 to this minion's 14. Nothing left in there. Shadow player, pass. Fellowship player, pass. 
We resolve the skirmish. Boromir is 16 to this minion's 14. And damage plus 3. This minion will now take 4 wounds, which he cannot handle, which means he's already dead. Here we are. Frodo and the Isengard Servant. Um, I got a few options. Uh, Mary could exert twice to make, uh... Frodo is stronger than this guy, and it's a pretty safe bet that the Shadow Player doesn't have any skirmish events left, or they would have used them to uh, make their Isengard retainer equal to Boromir. So, uh, we could have Frodo win, but it would come at a cost of two exertions to Merry. I don't think I'm ready for that yet. I have the option to let it slide and just take six to seven as a burden, or I can throw down an event and cancel the skirmish. I think I'm going to plan ahead on moving on again, and I want these ready to go. So I'm going to pass 6 to 7. The Shadow Player, yes, does not have any skirmish events. So pass. Skirmish resolves 6 to 7. Frodo is going to go ahead and put on the ring and take a burden. All right. Regroup actions. I do not have any re regroup actions over here. But the Shadow Player sure does. Going to exert to make the Free People's Player wound a companion. I'm going to wound Frodo. Exert to make the Free People's Player wound a companion. I'm going to exert Mary. What if Mary loses and takes a wound? We're going to give it to Sam. All right. Frodo and Sam are two wounds each. And even though... Boromir was able to embarrass the retainer. We are, again, gaining ground with the shadow side. We've got four wounds out there. Shadow player is going to reconcile real quick because they have the option so to do. I'm going to look at this and throw away my third dagger strike here, one of which was off camera. So I'm going to draw up to eight. There are some hobbit swords. Ooh. Wow. All right. Well, that's what you get. This Fellowship player is, um, after the Shadow player is reconciled, going to say, yes, let's charge forward. I think we're ready. Here comes Site 5. So, Fellowship player moves from Mithril Mine to the Bridge of khazad We had three Twilight left unused last turn. I'm going to count my companions. One, two, three, four. Put them out there. And I will also pay six, because this site has a total cost of six twilight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, shadow phase. This would be a great opportunity just oh, to throw down with 13 twilight. Guess what? That's what we got. Four. Yay. All right, shadow phase is over. Maneuver phase, neither player is going to use any maneuvers. Archery, neither player has any archery. Assignment, ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. well. Knowing, yeah, I gotta get in the fellowship frame of mind, so I'm gonna walk over here. Knowing that I've got two Hobbit intuitions ready to go, these say, again, at sites 1 to 4, cancel a skirmish. At any other site, we are now at site 5, so the second ability kicks in. Instead, make a hobbit strength plus 3. So, Frodo, Sam, and Mary have a good chance of surviving against overwhelms. Um, Boromir, without any further assistance over here, knows he can't beat this Uric Slayer. Because this Uric Slayer has the ability, strength 9, Skirmish, remove one, which I have plenty of, to make this minion strength plus one to a limit of plus three. So this minion is going to get up to strength 12 when the time comes. So we're just going to have Boromir bully this guy, 10 to seven. And then I think I'm just gonna send the Eric Slayer over to Frodo and uh, call it good. So here we are with Boromir. Let's have this skirmish first. I'm 10 to seven. That player has no skirmish events, so this minion takes two wounds, which he cannot handle, and goes to the discard pile. 
Make sure that wounds don't get mixed into your twilight pool. <laughs> All right, Frodo is six to 12. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna say pass and see what the shadow player feels like. Shadow player, skirmish action, remove one. I'm strength 10 of Frodo is six. Fellowship player, pass. Shadow player, remove one. Make the Eric Slayer strength plus one for 11. Fellowship player, pass. Shadow player, I'm gonna remove one to make the Eric Slayer strength 12 to Frodo 6. Ah, now this minion is overwhelming Frodo. Fellowship player, I'm gonna play Hobbit Intuition. Frodo is strength nine to the Eric Slayer's 12. Fellowship player, well, shadow player, skirmish actions, no. Okay, fellowship player, I'm going to pass. Both players have passed. Skirmish resolves. Frodo's nine. Tyrk Slayer's twelve. Once again, Frodo's going to put on the ring and take two burdens. All right, regroup actions. Nothing in here. Nothing in there. No orcs to exert. So this fellowship player has moved on both sites. The regroup phase is done. Guys out of there. Both players get to reconcile now. I'm going to get rid of that Hobbit sword. Draw six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if these are not minions, I'm going to... All right. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yep, like it. Draw it. Okay, day. Here we are. This player's second turn. This fellowship is at site three, Frodo's bedroom. We are at a sanctuary, so we may heal five wounds. No wounds to heal. Haha. <laughs> uh, but we better start catching up. I'm going to play a talent for not being seen. I will exert Frodo because that is part of the cost of this. To play Exert a Hobbit, place your support area, so down here. Each time the Fellowship moves, spot two Hobbit companions to make the shadow number of the site minus one, or spot four Hobbits, uh, in this case, Hobbit companions, uh, to make it minus two. At the moment, I do have four Hobbit companions, so I'm gonna make this site cost minus two. I'm also going to play, that cost zero, so nothing to add. Here's a Hobbit Sword to Mary. So, one for Mary. Here is a frying pan for Pippin. All right. So, zero for Pippin. Uh, that, that one costs zero. The rest of my hand is <laughs> Hobbit Self, Hobbit Self, Hobbit Intuition, Intuition, Intuition. Uh, so yes, I'm going to troll the Fellowship side thoroughly. Now I have one, two, three, four Hobbits. And the site costs three, but I do have a talent for not being seen. I'm going to spot my four hobby companions to make it minus two. So this will just cost one. Okay. Fellowship phase is over. Shadow phase. Yes, I've got resources now. We have not really gotten into these guys and what they do yet, but this is kind of an archery deck. So I have... Goblin Marksmen, Goblin Scavengers, uh, Hosts of Thousands, Drums in the Deep. What I'm going to do is um, notice real quick, these minions have a site number of four, so they are no longer roaming because we are at site four. <laughs> there we are. I have six to work with. I'm going to go ahead and play two minions while I can. One, two, three. Four, five, six. This minion says when you play this minion, you may play a weapon from your discard pile on your Moria Orc, but as you've seen so far this game, no such thing. Okay, so there we are. And uh, shadow phase is done. Maneuvers, I haven't got any. This player could decide to use there and back again, but I think they're going to elect not to. Uh, yeah. Don't need the strength bonus yet. Maneuver phase is done because both players have passed. Archery. All right, we have an archer on the board. 
No archery actions, but with one minion archery, this fellowship does have to take a wound. So I'm going to choose to take that wound over to Frodo. This ring is a special kind of ring which can take wounds as burdens anytime you would take wounds. However, the cost for that flexibility is you have to take two burdens instead of one. So Frodo is going to go ahead and take two burdens. There he is. Frodo is now wearing the ring and will do so until the end of the regroup phase. Assignment time. We have two characters to fight. I'm going to send the scavengers over to Pippin and I will send the goblin marksman over to Mary. Haha. <laughs> this fellowship player has made a mistake. We should have used there and back again after all. No, I'm not too worried. All we have to do is switch it up. Okay. Great. Now, uh, Pippin's gonna fight first. I have a frying pan. Fitting, we are in Moria. It says, exert bearer to wound an orc he or she is skirmishing. <laughs> so I'm gonna exert Pippin to wound this orc. This orc has a lowly vitality of one, so that will destroy the orc, the goblin marksman. Right into the discard pile. Mary is going to fight the Goblin Scavengers. Uh, by the way, the Shadow player can't play any uh, skirmish events on that because Pippin has ended the fight in one swift move. There's nothing to do. Uh, Mary is strength 7 to these Goblin Scavengers 8, but I'm just going to go ahead and throw down a Hobbit Intuition and cancel the skirmish. There it is. This Fellowship feels a little bit left behind, so they are going to move on. We have four guys. One, two, three, four. The site cost is six, but we do reduce it by two, spotting four Hobbit companions. So I'm gonna pay four for it. One, two, three, four. Now, I have made a mistake here. The, uh, before the Fellowship player technically decides, um, the Shadow player gets to reconcile first. Uh, the reason it matters is because the choice you make as a Shadow player about which card to remove from your hand would be better informed by knowing whether the Fellowship is gonna move on again or not. So the Fellowship does not yet have to say what their choice is going to be. So the Shadow Player has to reconcile a bit blind. Um, that being said, it will often happen in a game that the Fellowship Player uh, just says it before you know there's even a thought of it. It's very natural. Maybe that's just natural in our house. <clears throat> Anyhow. The Fellowship player does not get to reconcile because they are moving on, but the Shadow player does. And I'm going to get rid of, since I have two Archer Commanders, I'm going to get rid of one. There we are. I'm going to draw three cards. One, ooh, two, oh, three. Oh, I wish. Okay. So, four Hobbits, four for the site. One left over. <clears throat> I've got nine to work with. Yay! Options here. Four, seven, nine. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Okay. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. One, two. Okay. Now we're going to get some fighting in. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, so he here's what's what. Um, maneuver phase, no maneuvers over here. I have to think as the fellowship player for a moment. So, do 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 do. These works are pretty strong. I can smash a few though. I do want, um, yes. All right, this is gonna be, this is gonna be fine. I will not use the there and back again, so no maneuver. Archery. Okay, there are three archers on this side. No archery actions are gonna take place, but I do have to take three archery. I, I don't really wanna put on that many burdens on Frodo right now. 
So I'm just going to take the three across the board. One to Mary, one to Frodo as a wound, and one to Sam. I, I don't think I mentioned at the beginning of the previous regroup phase, the ring is off. Frodo is no longer wearing the ring. There we are. Wound, 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 three archery. Assignment. Uh, basically, I don't care. Um, Archer Commander, Mary, Sam, Frodo. Here's why I don't care. <laughs> Pippin, I'm going to cancel that skirmish. Forget you. Mary, uh, I'm going to cancel that skirmish. Forget you. Uh, Frodo, I'm going to cancel that skirmish. Sam, uh, let's cancel that skirmish. <laughs> All right, no fights. And look at this, no hand, woohoo! Which leads to a very rewarding uh, reconciliation. All right, the Fellowship player has moved on both sides that they can. So the turn is over, which means these minions are going to go away. <clears throat> Into the discard pile. All right, both players reconcile. There's nothing to scrap in this hand, so we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Not bad. And then, looking over here, uh, let's toss out one of these Hobbit intuitions. Why not? Well, yeah, okay, it's fine. 1, 2, 3, 4. Why not? All right, fellowship phase. This character, I mean this player. I have another flaming brand. I cannot play another one. Some of these rules I haven't even explained particularly. The flaming brand um, has a special print on it. This weapon may be born in addition to one other hand weapon. Typically, you cannot play two of the same, or yeah, two hand weapons on a companion at all. So, um, the Blade of Gondor would be it for Boromir, period. He could only wear that. But, the Flaming Brand has that special ability, which allows it to be on while the character is also using their sword. Again, this is <clears throat> rooted in the story. We think of Aragorn on Weathertop fighting the Nazgul with his sword and the Flaming Brand at the same time, uh, blocking the blades and setting Nazgul on fire. However... I can play an armor on Boromir, which reads, Bear must be a man, there is Boromir, Bearer takes no more than one wound during each skirmish phase. This doesn't mean, of course, that he has to take a wound if he wins, but if he loses to, say, an Uruk High with a damage bonus, he's only going to take one wound. There are also some minions who have the ability to wound you during the skirmish before the fight is over. In such case, Boromir could only be wounded once, and... Even having lost the skirmish, he wouldn't take any further wounds from losing. Um, a good little card. I can't play the Flaming Brand. I will probably get rid of it uh, during my next reconciliation time. I've got some skirmish events, so that's all. The armor had a twilight cost of one. There it is. I'm going to move on. The Shadow Player will furbish Site 6. Oh, nice! All right. So I have four companions. One, two, three, four. And the site cost is three. Valley of the Silver Load. When the Fellowship moves to Valley of the Silver Load, each Hobbit companion may heal. Both of my, both of the shadow sides and both of these decks are saying, grr. All right. There we are. Four companions, three for the site, one for the armor. There is eight for my opponent to work with. Shadow phase. Here's my hand. Ooh, all right. Not bad at all. I'm going to play an Isengard Retainer. Four. I'm going to give him an Isengard Axe. Add one as I do it. I don't want him just losing to Boromir offhand. Here's an Isengard Worker for two. I'm going to give him an Isengard Axe, too, and add one. Then, here's another Isengard Worker. He's going to cost two. All right, maneuver phase. No, both players pass. Archery phase. No, and no archers. End. Assignment. Boromir is going to take on the Isengard retainer. 
which seems to be the pattern, we are going to send this Isengard worker to Frodo because he is 6 to 5 and maybe he can beat him. Just make him take a wound for once. This Isengard worker is going to go over to Sam and we'll call it good. All right. Let me check this. Yeah. So, Boromir is going to fight first. I'm strength 10 to 10. Boromir is losing this fight. I'm going to play Sword Arm of the White Tower, make a Gondor Companion strength plus 2, or plus 4 if he's Defender plus 1. Defender plus 1 is another ability that we may get into later. Suffice to say, Boromir is not right now, um, unless he says otherwise. So, I just get the plus 2 from this. I am now strength 12 to this minion's 10. Now, um, I wasn't really even thinking through this, but am I risking Boromir losing a fight? Not too terribly, because I've got Mary over here, and if I really want to throw down, I can make Boromir strength plus 5 if this guy plays anything. As it stands, no skirmish events, no skirmish actions from the shadow side. They pass. Fellowship player, having strength over this guy, will also pass. So there we are, 12 to 10. Boromir is damage plus 1. The retainer will take 2 wounds. The shadow player will say, ah. Okay. Frodo, 6 to 5. Pass. Pass. Take a wound. Samwise, 5 to 7. I'm going to go ahead and play Hobbit Intuition. Sam is strength 8 to this minion 7. Alas, nothing. This minion will take a wound. Okay, regroup first. We're going to perform regroup actions. This minion will exert and make um, somebody wound. Uh, I'll take it to, ooh, take it to Saint Mary. Isengard worker will exert over here. I will take that wound to Sam. All right, and I have to think without anything ready to go. I I don't know that I can handle like another round of two or three minions. Some people might start to get overwhelmed. There's going to be a lot of wounds flying. Um, I think the shadow side has actually sufficiently scared this fellowship into chilling for a bit. So, this turn is going to end. Which means these guys are going over here. We will assume that the shadow player has already reconciled. Uh, since the turn is ending, the fellowship player also gets to reconcile. Toss out the flaming brand, drop to eight. One, two, three, four. Oh, it would be great, but I'm not going to be able to play a lot of these minions. Ah! Okay. Over here. I'm going to get rid of there and back again. Draw one, two, three, four, five, six. Holy mackerel. All right. Fellowship phase. This fellowship is at site five, the bridge of Khazadum. I have a proxy in my deck because I have a card that's so beat up. <laughs> I, I don't want it, like, muddying up the other cards. So, here's a Two Towers version of Sting, Don't Mind Me, is a stand-in for the Fellowship version of Sting. I'm going to play that on Frodo. Increase the choke value even more. All right, that is going to cost minus one, because it's being played on Frodo, for a total of zero. I also have a Hobbit Sword, so I'm going to give that to Sam. There's one for Sam. Finally, I will play Philbert Bulger, who has a cost of one. He is an ally, so he will chill out over here. The rest of my hand is events. So, I have one, two, three, four companions. And then I'm moving on to the Valley of the Silver Load, which has a twilight cost of three. I'm going to subtract two from it, so it costs one. A talent for not being seen is a really nice card right now. Also, again, value of the silver load lets me heal each hobbit as I move on. One, 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 one. Quick note, Frodo had two wounds on him, and uh, when a card says heal, unless it specifies otherwise, heal specifically means one wound. So I do not get to heal Frodo all the way. I get to heal one wound from him. So he has one remaining. 
Alrighty, shadow player. I have seven. That is something. Okay. Let's play. Hmm. Ooh. Ooh. I know as a shadow player that even if they have stealth events in their hand, we are past site five, so there's going to be no more canceling. <sighs> Pippin does have that frying pan, though. Durr! <laughs> oh, darn it. Oh, well. I, I'm I'm going to go ahead and play uh, a Goblin Spearman for three. That is, for two, and then one for the spear. This guy is hot when he has a spear because he has damage plus two. I could do three wounds to a hobbit. He is definitely going to meet his grizzly end at a frying pan, though. Um, so there we are. Uh, let's also play... Oh... A host of thousands. And we will grab the Archer Commander. Because he has two vitality. I like it. Alright. No, that was a Drums in the Deep. Don't mind me. Don't don't let your opponent see the wrong card. Okay. Don't tell him you have a surprise waiting. Alright. Host of Thousands lets you play a Moria Orc from your discard pile. You do, of course, have to pay the Twilight cost of that Orc. But the event is zero. So... It's a free event, you just pay for the minion. All right, that's all seven. Maneuvers, no. Well. Yeah, let's throw down. I'm gonna use my there and back again. My hobbits are all strength plus two now. Well, these guys are, all right. So, there and back again, you discard this condition to make each Hobbit companion strength plus two until the regroup phase. Frodo is eight, Sam is seven, Mary is nine, and Pippin is six. Mary has an ability, while he bears a hand weapon, he is an extra plus two, so three plus two plus two, seven, and then there and back again, nine. Haha. -ha. Alright. Now, uh, archery. I have to take an archer from the archer commander. I'm going to send over to uh, Frodo. I may regret that later. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. Assignment. So we're going to send the spearman at Pippin. Ah, and Mary is already strength nine to this archer commander's eight. So, hey. All right. Pippin will fight first and exert and wound the Goblin Spearman who has a vitality of one and send him away. Mary is strength nine to the Archer Commander's eight. And what he's actually going to do is plan ahead because I might want to move on. Mary's going to throw a dagger strike down. So he has a hand weapon, gives him plus two and damage plus one. So Mary is now 11 to this Archer Commander's eight and he's damage plus one. So, I'm looking over here. I do have a Drums in the Deep, but it will only make me 10 to Mary's 11, so I'm not going to bother playing it right now. I pass as the Shadow Player. Fellowship Player passes. The Archer Commander dies. Now, the Fellowship has to make a gutsy decision. Do they want to stay and heal, or do they want to keep going? And it largely depends on what we have left in our hand. A couple hobbit stealths. We do have Pippin with a frying pan. We're doing pretty good on the choke. And although we have three wounds, it could be a lot worse. I think we're gonna charge ahead. So, I have four companions. One, two, three, four. And now, since I'm the fellowship player and there's not a site seven out here, I'm gonna ask my opponent to play site seven. So here we go. There it is. The Anduin Confluence has a Twilight Cost of 6. I spot 4 Hobbit Companions, so I'm going to reduce it down by 2 to 4. So my opponent has 8 to work with. Good luck. Pardon me for being a uh, bad example setter here. I reconcile before the Fellowship Player decides. <laughs> At least you'll hear me say that over and over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right. I have eight to work with, and like 
I'm not terribly disappointed, except, again, Pippin is going to murder me. I could... Hmm. There's that. There's that. There's that. I guess what I want to do, then, as the minion player, is try to add on the wounds, if possible. So I'm going to play a Moria Archer Troop for six. And I will play a Goblin Spearman just to get him out of my hand and to make Pippin have a reason to either exert or take a wound. But that is foolish because what will actually happen is probably Mary will fight. Um, someone's going to take a wound, though. All right. Maneuvers. Neither player. Archery. Yes, take one. So, archery to... How about Mary? Assignment. We're going to send uh, the Goblin Spearman over to Mary. Seven to six. And then... We'll send a Moria Archer Troop over here to, to Sam. Yeah, seems good. Or, how about Frodo? Frodo, great. All right, skirmish. Mary first. I am seven to the Goblin Spearman six. Oh, there's the drums in the deep. All right. Goblin Spearman is 8 to Mary 7. Mary is going to play a skirmish event, Hobbit Stealth, which adds 1. Now Mary is 9 to the Goblin Spearman's 8. I have nothing further. Fellowship player is nothing further. Goblin Spearman loses 8 to 9. Discarded. Moria Archer Troop is 8 to Proto 6. I will pass. Fellowship player will pass. Six to eight. Frodo will lose and will put on the ring, and for his wound, will take two burdens. I am noticing as a Fellowship player that I have Moria Archery against me, so as much as I can, I want to stack the wounds into Frodo's resistance right now. This Fellowship has moved on twice. Oh, pwned. You know what I, you know what I forgot? Anduin Confluence. When the Fellowship moves to Anduin Confluence, discard every ally. Filbert, Bulger, and Bounder are gone. They are not dead. Um, no, no companion or ally has died yet. If a companion or ally dies, like in a skirmish or by wounding, they go into a dead pile, which means that, uh, representatively, that character does not come back, uh, unless they're non-unique. When a companion or ally is simply discarded, they might make another appearance, but for now they're in the discard pile. Uh, so we have discarded every ally, Philber, Bulger, and Bounder are no longer with us. Since this Fellowship has moved on twice, they can move no further. Minions are gone. Both players will reconcile. I'm going to hold on to that Hobbit Stealth over here because I'm now ahead and maybe I want to make a double move to the end. But I'm going to keep these two minions in case I can play them and uh, see what I can do. Whoa. That's a handful of minions. All right. Over here, I'm going to get rid of ooh, Ranger Sword and draw four. One, two, three, and four. All righty then. Well, here we are. This fellowship represented by Powertrain, is at the uh, Valley of the Silverload at Site 6. Site 6 is also a sanctuary. When you begin your turn at a sanctuary, you may heal five wounds. One, two, three, four. And I don't have any other wounds to heal. Uh, Frodo has four burdens. Now, over here, uh, we didn't get to heal, like, after Site 6 because we didn't start a turn there. We moved from Site 5 to Site 6 and then 6 to 7 in the same turn. But the ability on Site 6 was nice. We did at least get to heal each Hobbit once because that's what that specific copy of Site 6 said. 
I have no cards to play in the Fellowship phase, so I have four companions. I'm moving on to Site 7. I must discard every ally. I have none. One, two, three, four, five, six. Small note, and this may not be easy to remember right now. If I had allies, I would not discard them when this Fellowship moved to Site 7, because they would not exist as card types at all when this Fellowship is active. So any companions over here basically lose all status as cards, and any allies, any Fellowship cards are not considered active during my opponent's turn. Then during my turn, my opponent's Fellowship's cards are not considered active. Similarly, on uh, my opponent's turn, their minion cards are not considered active, and on my turn, my minion cards are not considered active either. So they don't have uh, any influence on the game until it's the relevant turn. Here we are, four and six, so we have ten. And that's that. Shadow player. Shadow phase. I got a couple beastly guys, but I can really only play two minions total. So I'm going to go ahead and play a Yurik Slayer, because I like that uh, strength bonus. I'm going to play a Yurik High Raiding Party. A couple of Urukai, some nice damage bonuses. Call it good. Alrighty. Maneuvers. Nope. Archery. No, no. Assignment. Well, what have I gotten here? I think I could win. I'm going to dare to assign the Eric Slayer to Boromir. And then the raiding party can go over to Frodo. Because why not? Alright. So... Here we are, Boromir versus the Uruk Slayer. I'm gonna play a, well, first I'm gonna pass because I'm already beating him, 10 to nine. Uruk Slayer, action, remove one. I'm 10 to your 10. Boromir is going to play Swordsman of the Northern Kingdom. So he is 12 to this Uruk Slayer's 10. Now, normally the Uruk Slayer could remove two more to make himself strength plus two, but I only have one left. So the Yurik Slayer could only get up to 11, so that's not going to help me. So the Yurik Slayer is just going to chill. Skirmish resolves. 12 to 10. Yurik Slayer takes two wounds because of the Blade of Gondor. And that's that. Frodo. I'm 6 to 9. I don't know if I feel like losing, but... I'm going to pass. Opponent passes. Frodo will go ahead and take... Um... Oh... Two burdens. I suppose it helps that I know uh, what my, my my deck looks like over there. But do beware of the five burden threshold. As a note to future players, at this point, Enquia could come out and terrorize you. Enquia is a minion who can exert to wound any companion he chooses if he spots five burdens or six companions. With Frodo at six burdens, I can spot at least five. Enquia could, for example, exert Boromir, well, exert and then wound Boromir three times, and Boromir would die. So that would be very bad news. Okay, so here I am at the Anduin Confluence, and I think I'm not terribly worried yet. What I want to do is, as a Fellowship player, since my opponent is on Site 7 too, and they could move double to Site 9 next turn, I want to put the pressure on them to try to have to make that decision. So I'm going to move on, even though I can't make it to Site 9 yet. I have four companions, and now my opponent will play Site 8. There it is. Is it still in the shot? No. Power train, moving to the Anduin Banks. All right, four companions. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we've got uh, four, eight, eleven for the Shadow Player to work with. Hey, let's pretend the Shadow Player already reconciled. Um, as the Shadow Player, I'm going to get rid of the Isengard Smith, who has a wonderful ability if I spot five companions. Right now, I don't care, though. Um, one, two, three. Ooh, ooh. All right. Um, I have 11 to work with as the Shadow Player. I'm going to play two Yurik Slayers. Well, no, if I don't leave myself anything. I'm going to play Yurikai Raiding Party for four. 
an Isengard retainer for four, and an Isengard servant for three. I'm gonna put on the hurt as much as I can. Okay. Maneuvers. Neither for either player. Archery. Nope. We will pass. Assignment. I will send Bormir at the Isengard retainer because I want Bormir to reduce this character's vitality. Uh, and he has the damage bonus because I don't want him exerting later. For the same reason, I want the Isengard Servant to lose the skirmish. I'm going to send him to Frodo. And then, somewhat risky, I'm going to use your Kai Raiding Party to Sam, your Kai Raiding Party to Mary. Oh. Okay. Here we are. Because Mary is going to be relevant to the fight with Frodo over here, first, um, I want to see if he survives or what. Uh, well, basically, I, I know pretty well that Frodo's going to survive six to seven. So I want to keep Mary alive as much as possible. So I don't want to exert Mary early and get wounded. More to the point, anyways, Mary says, if Mary is not assigned to a skirmish, exert him twice to add his strength to another companion. Right now we are. So there's no way I could use Mary's ability until we weren't assigned. As it stands, once Mary loses, he's going to take two wounds, so he's going to lose his ability to exert, but exert twice anyhow. All that being said, here's Mary. I'm five tier nine. I'm at risk of an overwhelm, but we're not there yet. He needs strength ten to get me. I will pass. Shadow player will pass. All right, Mary breathes a sigh of relief. I'll take two wounds because this minion is damage plus one. So Mary has to take two. In the same way, Sam will fight this year Kai rating party. I will pass. Five to nine. Shadow player passes. Whew. Sam will take two wounds. This guy is damage plus one. Frodo is going to try his best. I've got... Uh, Six to your seven. I'm going to play a dagger strike. So I'm eight to this minion seven. Shadow player passes. Fellowship player passes then. And this minion must take two wounds. Good job, Frodo. Boromir is strength ten to this minion's eight. I'm going to say nothing. Shadow player is going to say nothing. This minion must take two wounds. Mary and Sam did take four wounds, so good job on the Yurkai raiding party's part. But... The Isengard Servant and the Isengard Retainer don't have extra vitality to exert with, so they may not use their uh, regroup special ability. The turn is done, so there's no decision about reconciliation. Both players will just do it. The Silverload Banks um, says, for each companion in the Fellowship over four, add two to the minion archery total. That counts even if there are no archers on the minion side as long as there is at least one minion. So a small rule here, if there are no minions played during the shadow phase, then there are simply no maneuver, archery assignment, or skirmish phases. They are all passed. Which means that even if I had nine companions over here, and Anduin Banks would then add ten archery, because there would be no minion out there, if there was none, uh, there would be no archery phase, and so no archery would be taken. Um, you know, that might come up later. It's a small rule. In this case, I have four companions, no companions over four. So even though there are minions over here, there's no extra archery. Zero archery was taken. There we are. The turn is over. These minions disappear. There they go. Um, I want to... Stock up for minions. I'm going to get rid of... They are coming. Because it's expensive. And... Um, it, it's costly. I mean, not just Twilight. It's expensive that way. It would take three cards to generate other minions from my discard pile. And even though I kind of need that, I need the minions themselves. I'm going to draw one, two, and three. All right. We're suited up pretty well. There's Legolas. All right. Over here, we're going to really think about moving on twice. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of a Yurik Slayer and draw one, two, three, four. 
<laughs> All right. Here we are at site seven. This site said, when the fellowship moves to Anduin Confluence, discard every ally. We have already moved to it, so I can now play an ally and not have to discard him. There is Bounder. That will cost me one. I have a frying pan, but all of my companions already have uh, weapons. I cannot simply replace them, so the frying pan has to sit here and mock me. I'm going to have to count on Pippin for easy minion removal, but I do have a <laughs> seeker weapon ready to go. Um, that is it. I have four companions. I'll move on to the Anduin Banks, which has a twilight cost of six. I'm going to make a minus two by talent for not being seen, so it'll cost four. My opponent has nine to work with. Nine with which to work. I'm going to go ahead and play, I guess, what I can. Um, I'm going to try to play the numbers here. So let's play, if it were possible. I only have nine, though. Three, three. That could be something. I'm going to play my Goblin Scavengers for three. I will go ahead and play Goblin Spearman for two. And I will play Goblin Marksman for three. Marks and man. Okay. I do have a spear here. And I do have a Goblin Spearman. But... No matter what I do, Pippin is going to exert with the frying pan to kill one of my minions here. If I put the spear, it's obviously going to be the spearman. And I want to save Twilight for next turn, if at all possible, to play minions. Um, so this turn, my job is going to be to play these two drums in the deep and to uh, generate some extra space in my hand uh, and save Twilight for myself. Okay. Maneuver. Neither character has maneuvers. Archery. I'm going to go ahead and, um, well, you know what? I'm going to take it to Sam. There he goes. He might be able to have the ring later, so. Yeah. Assignment. I'm going to assign the marksman to Pippin because I just don't like archery wounds. I'm going to assign... Goblin Spearman to Mary in case I can just knock him out. And Frodo will go to the Goblin Scavengers. Alright, here we are with Pippin. Pippin is going to exert and wound the Marksman. Pippin is the MVP with his frying pan. Mary is six to the Spearman's uh, seven to the Goblin Spearman's six. I don't want my minions to just die. I'm going to play Drums in the Deep. So I'm eight to Mary's seven. Mary is going to play a Hobbit Stealth. Adding one to the Twilight Pool. And I'll say, haha, you added one. Now, I'm going to play Drums in the Deep. I am 10 to Mary's 9. Mary has nothing left to do. Let us confirm for a moment. Nope. All right. Mary will take a wound, and the Goblin Spearman lives on. I have also done my job of getting these out of my hand. So my hand can get bigger. Frodo is 6 to the Goblin Scavengers 8. He is going to go ahead and, well, not play anything. I don't have anything to play as the Shadow Player, so Frodo will take a wound. Alright. Frodo does not want to cross the 5 burn threshold in case Enquia is around, so he's not going to put on 2 burns yet. These two are around. Fellowship, well... Shadow player gets to reconcile. I remembered. I'm looking at this and saying, um, uh, do, 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 do. Honestly, I'm going to get rid of Legolas. Oh, all right. Draw six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ooh, not bad. Not bad at all. All right. Frodo. Oh, I messed up. I messed up. Here we are with this hand. This will come to us later. This is our hand. Frodo has a regroup action. 
With Sting, Fellowship or Regroup, exert Frodo to reveal an opponent's hand. Remove one for each orc revealed, limit four. Frodo wants to remove some Twilight, so he's going to exert and take a look at my opponent's hand during the regroup phase. This is my hand at the beginning of the regroup phase. My opponent sees it, but there are no orcs, so haha, -ha, Frodo, eat that. It was, a, it, it was worth a shot, though. Okay, so no Twilight removal, and Frodo is now exhausted, but that should be okay. All right, so now, no regroup actions left. Shadow player reconciles, gets rid of Legolas, draws these six cards, and the free people's player is going to move on. Oh, yeah. So, um, let me go to this side for a moment. Here I am, Sam, Frodo, Mary, Pippin. Since I'm moving on to Site 9, I'm going to ask my opponent to play it. Because the opponent plays the site, rather than you. Here it is, the Summit of Amon Hen. When the Felsher moves to the Summit of Amon Hen, each Shadow player may draw a card for each burden. So, let's pay for things a moment. One, two, three, four companions. And, site cost of eight over here. Reduced by two for a total of six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So we have 12. That's pretty good. Then the shadow player also gets to draw four cards because we have four burdens out there. So we get a one, two, three, four. Big ol' hand. The question is what to do. Oh, they're in here. Uh, what to do with it. So... We want to try to play the numbers game and swarm their fellowship here. We have a couple of hosts of thousands, which can get us small orcs um, from the discard pile. Uh, but we, yeah. Honestly, it doesn't look great. Except, I would think to myself, at least I have a chance here of getting multiple minions on Frodo. I'm gonna... Ooh, you know what I will do? You know what I will do? One, two, three, four. No, they would survive it. Okay, they're going to survive the archery. Fine. I will play. Goblin Scavengers. I have the option to play a weapon from my discard pile, but I don't want to spend the Twilight because my spears cost one. I will play Goblin Scavengers for three. I will play a host of thousands and grab and Z... You know what? Send this guy back. I'm going to grab an Archer Commander for four. Then I will play this Marksman for three. And I'll play another Host of Thousands and grab that Goblin Archer Bowman for two. Okay. For what it's worth, we've done something right here. We have six minions on the table to the Fellowship's four. So now rules get a little interesting. I have plenty of minions left in my hand. If I were fighting a bigger Fellowship, they could do so much. <laughs> Alas. We have still accomplished throwing six minions out there. Maneuver phase. Well, there is no maneuvers over here. We don't have any there and back again. Here's what I will do. I'm going to exert Sam twice. He has this ability, exert Sam twice, to make him defender plus one until the regroup phase. So there he is, he's defender plus one. Nope. Uh, well, we're going to do it. We're going to do it and see how stupid that was. But uh, I may regret that. All right. Sam is defender plus one, so he can take on two big guys. Uh... Maneuvers beyond that, no. Archery, I do have one, two, three archers over here. Sam is exhausted, Frodo's exhausted, Merry and Pippin can each take a wound. So I'm gonna give a wound to Pippin, I'm gonna give a wound to Merry, and I'm gonna take two burdens to Frodo. All right, that's okay, that's okay. We have crossed the five burden threshold, but we're on the last site, and um, there's proof. Obviously there's no Enquia out here, so 
we're not going to have to worry about him. Sam is going to take on the two biggest minions during the assignment phase. So, I said during the maneuver phase, I'll exert Sam twice to make him defender plus one. Here's what that means. Sam now has the ability to fight two minions of his choosing. He is defending, like, plus one minion. So the archer commander has a strength of eight, and this goblin marksman has a strength of nine. Keep calling them goblin marksmans. All right. So Sam is fighting two characters to take the pressure off of Frodo. Now, I can assign one to one. I'm going to give a scavenger to Pippin. Ow. I don't even want Pippin to die. Well, he's going to die anyways. <laughs> well, the pain. Um, I'm going to give a spearman to Mary. I'm going to give the bowman to Frodo. And you'll notice there is one minion left out here. This is a common occurrence. You have more minions out than you have companions. It took us the whole game to get here, but this happens a lot. Again, normally, during the assignment phase, the Fellowship player assigns one companion to one minion in any way they so choose. If there are more companions, sorry, more minions than companions, then after the Fellowship player has assigned one minion to one companion, and any extra minions based on defender bonuses to the defender plus one companion, then any leftover minions become uh, the shadow player's choice where to place that minion. And now more than one minion can be stacked on a companion to add strength together. In this case, I wanna knock Frodo out as best as I can. So I'm gonna go ahead and send these guys over here. I already know I'm losing though because there's a bounder over there, but we're gonna try it. And then Frodo's gonna embarrass us. Okay, so assignment phase. Um, quick check, no skirmish events over here. Um, Pippin is four to eight. I have nothing as a fellowship player. I have nothing as the shadow player. Pippin is overwhelmed, four to eight, so he automatically dies. If not, he would take a wound and die. So he goes into the, de the dead pile. Bye-bye. Okay. Mary is seven to six. Fellowship player plays nothing. Shadow player plays nothing. Goblin Spearman will die. Let's look at Sam a second. Sam is fighting two minions, one with a strength of eight and one with a strength of nine. The reason this minion has nine rather than seven is because he is an archer, and this minion makes each other Moria archer strength plus two. We add their two strengths together because the companion is fighting both of them. So we have a strength total of 17 to Sam's five here. Sam is going to play no skirmish action. I'm going to play no skirmish action as the minion player. So Sam is easily overwhelmed. And um, he would take a wound anyways, and he's exhausted. So dead either way, but technically no wounds are received. Sam is just overwhelmed and dead. So there's those minions. Finally, we have Frodo. Frodo is strength 6 to their 12. So, unless I do some sort of skirmish event here, or skirmish action, Frodo will die. I have two options. One, I'm going to take care of right now. I have Bounder, and he has an ability which says, exert this ally to prevent a hobbit from being overwhelmed unless that hobbit strength is tripled. So, counting these minions' strength, 8 and 4, together, they have a strength of 12 to Frodo's 6. That would normally overwhelm him, but now his strength must be tripled, so they would need a strength of 18 to kill him automatically. Shadow player has nothing to play, so they will pass. For the cherry on top, Fellowship player is going to play power according to his stature. Add one burden to wound each minion skirmishing the ring bearer. Wound, wound. These both have a vitality of one, so they are just dead. Frodo suddenly has nobody fighting him in the first place and cannot be overwhelmed unless his strength is tripled. So he survives. It is the beginning of the regroup phase. The Fellowship player's Frodo has survived. The Fellowship player wins. Victory to this deck. So, there we are. We've made it to Site 9. Fellowship survived. That means this Fellowship um, did not lose in, in, in its own right, but 
this shadow side lost, so this player loses the game. This player wins the game. A few uh, contingencies to think through. Both of these decks were running Sam. Um, here's one version, here's another. This one has the Defender plus one thing, this has the Burden removal thing, but both, and almost every Sam, has an ability that says, response, if Frodo dies, make Sam the ring bearer. So, supposing for a moment that uh, Sam had resolved his skirmish later, um, and Frodo had not played power according to his stature or exerted with bounder, then what would happen is Frodo would die um, fighting these two minions, being overwhelmed, and the ring would pass to Sam. Sam was fighting these two characters. Now Sam is the ring bearer, and even though Frodo died, Sam carries the ring, and uh, we are not without a ring bearer in this fellowship, even though Frodo is in the dead pile. Now Sam, because we had not exerted Bounder, could play the power according to his stature, now being the ring bearer, adding a burden, because he has a resistance of five, wounding this minion to destroy him, wounding this minion, and now being, well he also had a hobbit uh, sword, <laughs> being six to eight, he can also exert Bounder and not be overwhelmed unless uh, my opponent reaches 18. But the point is he's six to eight, easily survives, he can take a wound, not a problem, because he has an extra vitality now from the ring. Great. Similarly, if this Frodo had ever died, the ring could pass on to Sam, and Sam would be the ring bearer, assuming Sam is still alive. And there we are. Sam has a resistance of five. Until you get to series uh, nine, which is well beyond the fellowship block, Frodo is always your starting ring bearer, and the only possible alternate ring bearer is Sam in case Frodo dies. Finally, Frodo cannot pass the ring to Sam if he gets corrupted. If he reaches 10 burdens total, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you have automatically lost the game. Frodo is not dead, and therefore Sam is not taking the ring. Instead, Frodo has succumbed to the temptation of the ring, and he's running away from the fellowship and hiding in a cave somewhere. And, uh, the free peoples are in trouble. So, um, no passing the ring to Sam if Frodo becomes corrupted. Let us do a very quick recap. Alright, so we're looking kind of messy here. Uh, let me pause for a moment. Okay, quick recap time. At the beginning of the game, neither player ideally knows what Frodo you're running or what ring. And fellowship, starting fellowships are not yet decided. Both players come to the table with a burden bidding. And um, whoever bids the most burdens gets to choose whether they want to go first or second. It is usually a good idea to go first because you get to throw down your site one, which often has text to help you set up your fellowship in the way that you like. And it also gets you rolling down the adventure path uh, first. Uh, that can also... You know, that's often very important. As you can see in the game we just played, these guys went first, and because they hesitated for a moment, the Fellowship coming from behind was still able to overtake them. Which may seem to go against my point. The idea here is going first is very important because you have the initiative. There's no way um, for someone to outdistance you if you never hesitate. You could die, you could push yourself too far, and I think there was a reason for them to stop at Site 6 when they did, but uh, it's up to you. If you go first, the game is sort of in your hands in that way. Then you reveal your Frodo and your ring, and knowing whether you go first or second, the first player plays down the Site 1 in their adventure path. When both players know what that Site 1 is, that can influence what fellowship you choose out of the deck that you have built. Most of the time you know what your starting fellowship is. It's not uncommon for people to just see the game started like this and be like, yeah, I don't care. Um, plus, I didn't even realize that rule for basically my entire Lord of the Rings career until the other day. So here we are. Okay, first player plays their site one. Then they play from a hand of eight cards, fellowship cards, including companions, allies, possessions, events with the keyword fellowship, and uh, conditions. 
fellowship conditions. We next move to the shadow phase. The shadow player plays shadow cards. Then we have the maneuver phase, archery phase, assignment, skirmish, and regroup. When the turn is done, all minions are cleared off of the table, and it re uh, goes to the other player for their fellowship turn. Both players reconcile. If a fellowship moves on beyond the first site that they've moved to in a turn, the shadow player gets to reconcile, the fellowship player does not, and the Shadow player should reconcile before the Fellowship player even makes their decision. Frodo can survive to Site 9 and thereby win. Or you can kill your opponent's Frodo, assuming they don't have Sam. If they do have Sam and he takes the ring, then you have to get their Sam too. Um, so winning conditions are surviving through Site 9 or destroying both or all of your opponent's ring bearers, Frodo or Sam, or corrupting your opponent's ring bearer. Um, yeah, a lot of details. On the back of your rule book, you'll see this handy dandy uh, walkthrough. So, Fellowship, Shadow, Maneuver, Archery, Assignment, Skirmish, and Regroup. Just remember that uh, Fellowship players, for each of their cards, pay into the Twilight Pool, and then Shadow players remove from the Twilight Pool. And since we're talking about starting Fellowships, just again, your starting Fellowship should total up to four. One, two, three, four. There are further rules as you get into later sets. This is a look at Fellowship Block. That's about all I have to say for now. Um, I'm going to leave a link in the description to, um, well, the, the wiki version, um, Lord of the Rings TCG wiki group, of um, sort of the comprehensive rules. So if you don't have one of these in print, you can look at it online. Um, I'll try to also leave a link to just the PDFs there. And uh, lastly, a link to the Player Council's How to Learn How to Play page, which has additional resources and videos for you to look at. Thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.